aware of uh, because I want to make sure that you walk away with this with some uh, education uh, in addition to uh, um, some good perspective on the, the topic. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring up our slide deck here and we're as we talk through our agenda today, um, I'm going to talk about how a hacker will profile a target and what that means. Uh, types of attacks such as phishing, cyber squatting, and uh, impersonation attacks, and then um, how we can protect ourselves in uh, talking about password strength and some other, some other uh, ways that we can um, help us to avoid being a target. So as we get into the material here, and uh, I can see a couple guys joining, I'll, I'll wait just one second while their audio connects, James and Adash. Yeah, and a big thanks for everybody to joining this RFL Live Resiliency Experience. We started these up in May as a response to COVID, knowing that, you know, just leadership skills, information, knowledge, we need this to help us like thrive and survive and cope um, and be more resilient in this environment. So I really appreciate Far joining us today. And of course, um, Jen is an RFL alumni who said, I want, you know, Far would be a great topic. And absolutely, there's so many different topics under um, resiliency. And I, I, my, my story Far is, um, you know, I do a lot of the web building and maintenance and, you know, the Salesforce database and all of our email administration programs office. And I am, I know I have a high trust level, like my mm -hmm. trust level, like I meet somebody and you get my trust. So I have a filter of like, oh, nobody's going to hack me. This is going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm excited to learn more about what you do and what you're going to share with us today. So that um, knowing the increased technology um, mm -hmm. that we're all getting more used to because of work from home and all those types of things that have occurred. I th this is just such an amazing topic to be more aware of to help us be resilient with our technology mm -hmm. use. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, that's a nice uh, uh, frame to talk about. And I think that's one thing that I would like everyone to be able to think about is um, should we really be that trusting? Uh, and, and I would say a healthy level of paranoia as it relates to cyber is going to be uh, is in our best interest. So as we talk more about those topics, I wanted to kind of start the conversation with a small video um, because a lot of people hear about hacking and they don't really understand how does it work? Uh, can they really do these things? Do I really need to put the piece of tape on my webcam because somebody's going to watch me? Um, and so I, wa I wanted to start out the, uh, the uh, meeting with a demonstration. And uh, to give you a frame of reference, there is a conference every year uh, that all the hackers uh, like to go to, and it's uh, all paid in cash. Uh, so you go to this conference and you pay cash to get in the door, and it's attended by um, federal agents and people that are actively working in the industry, good and bad. So here uh, we have a journalist, and he's going to be at this conference. And so to prepare himself for this conference, uh, he engages uh, somebody to see what they can do. And so that's our video. Let's take a look at that, and then we'll, we'll uh, re- uh, discuss from there things you did how did you start hacking me uh, i quickly found your squarespace blog and had an idea uh, basically what i did was created a bogus squarespace site and sent an email to you um a fish asking you to go to this website run this certificate installer and i did it because yeah. i'm an idiot so once you ran that uh it gave me access to your computer and i created several fake pop-ups that looked like system pop-ups uh, that would ask you for your credentials. You didn't even have to have my passwords. No, you gave them to me. I gave them to you. Yeah. So I, I stole your 1Password keychain. That's and 1Password password. is where I store all my other passwords. So effectively by- And your social security number and your Amex stuff and all your stock trading and bank information. I can send email to everyone in this room as you. I am you right now, if I wanted to be. If my evilness is working correctly, it should actually be taking pictures of your desktop and pictures through your webcam every two minutes. And I have been watching you for about two days now. In oh coffee shops, at your mom's house, on a plane. Here's your editing stuff. There's you like- Oh my God, so this is literally- Every two minutes- Through my webcam. Yeah, through this guy. How badly could you have messed up my life? I could have made you homeless. I could have made you homeless and penniless. How? I, how, how would you make me homeless? Like I have control of- your, your digital life in its entirety. 
I have all your credentials, I have all your access to all your financial information, all your work information, all your personal information. I can pay people with your bank account or your Amex account. I am you. I can fully impersonate. Like, the only thing I couldn't doctor would be like your fingerprints. This is like as bad as it gets. It's ridiculous, yeah, it's bad. So, so that's a that's a real life situation. Uh, you guys got to see uh, his computer, the bad guy. Uh, where they've got programs that are designed to help them attack you and uh, take advantage of you. In fact, there's a whole network of people and they literally provide tech support to bad guys on how to exploit uh, people like us and our businesses. So uh, that's real life. And uh, did anybody notice, um, if anybody wants to unmute and answer this question, anybody notice how the attacker was able to gain control of his computer? So in the, in the video, uh, he talked about how he basically created a real looking email and that was something that he was relevant to the user. And so now this person's like, oh, I recognize this. This is my Forspace account. Let me go ahead and click on this certificate that I need to install because they told me I needed to run an update. So that type of attack is a phishing attack. Um, there's a number of different uh, types of attacks related to uh, this. We call phishing. Um, uh, there's also spear phishing where you're targeting a certain person. There's one where you do it over uh, video text. It's called vishing. There's all these different acronyms uh, related to the attack. But the key thing is, is that that person knew how to reach you. They knew something you were going to look at and they crafted something that they thought would be attractive to you, uh, like a fisherman with some bait. So when they did that, um, he was able to lure him in uh, to installing something on his computer. And at that point, it's only a matter of time. So one of the things that I wanted to help you guys uh, see is what we call the, the, uh, the, pre, the evolution of an attack. So the first thing that uh, a hacker might do is he's going to do some pre-exploitation research. And uh, the three areas that we find that they might find this information is uh, your IT infrastructure, uh, administrative passwords, for example, or an admin password on your computer. It could also be uh, people that are creating data, uh, database administrators or people that are inputting data that have access to input and, and uh, export things from systems. And also uh, we see uh, external facing programs. So let's say that your uh, website has the ability for a vendor to uh, take money from you or for you to give a vendor money. That vendor is now interfacing with your website or your system. And now there is a portal that needs to be secured. So that could be a sales, a vendor, marketing, uh, financial, it could be a number of things. So they do some research on that. And as they, uh, as they go on, maybe they find out a little more about you. Uh, how much information could they find out about you on LinkedIn? or uh, on your company if they went to monster.com and found out that you were looking for an IT manager. And it wouldn't it be great if your IT manager knew Cisco platform and Linux because we have a Linux server and we use this and we use that. All of this is in the job ad. Now the hacker has a profile of your environment. It would be similar to that person driving around the building, looking at the fences and the entryways to try to see how to get in. So there is definitely homework that's going into this when, you, when uh, they are targeting you for an attack and what's on the web can be their, their richest uh, source of information. So as we, uh, as we look further, uh, now they come up with this game plan. So they've, they've cased the building, they've seen kind of what the infrastructure looks like, uh, they've discovered your email address, they're looking to see do you use Google, do you use Office 365, how do we actually get them uh, when, we, when we send that lure out, how do we get them to click on it? And welcome to Sandra, nice to have you with us as well. Um, so they've got this profile, now um, they launch it, you click on the link, They've got access to your computer and guess what? Now they're exporting data. So you can believe that by the time you might think, hey, by the time I realize the hack has happened, they didn't just get entry into your system. They've probably been into the system for a while and they're pulling data out. They're looking through this information. What can I gather? And it's probably on a Dropbox account or something that your network already gives permission for users to use. And so we call that hiding in plain sight. Um, he, now, there's a lot of defense uh, opportunities around that as well um, that we can protect ourselves, but I wanted to show you this timeline here. 
Imagine that I'm trying to break into a house and I can either get in through doors or windows. And the windows uh, might have bars around them, but the, the window's always open. So I've got to figure out if I can get into this window. Well, a network, a single device has about 65,000 windows. And when they get into that window or into the door, imagine that the lights are off. And now you're trying to figure out, well, what, where am I? Where, where did I land? Am I in a room that has a jewelry box or a safe? Or do I need to figure out how to get around? Where's the light switch? So a lot of times people don't realize that the hacker has actually been in your environment for many, many days until they actually decide that they're going to do something like ransom your data. Because by the time they want to ransom your data, maybe that's been 200 days later, they've already figured out all the exit plans. They figured out how to avoid uh, you getting rid of them. Um, they know if you have a backup or not. Uh, they've, they've got a lot of information about your system. Maybe they've downloaded all your email and they're already looking at all that information. Um, so uh, keep in mind that if you start to get the idea that uh, someone has been in your environment, they probably didn't just get into the environment. So we'll talk a little more about remediation uh, as we move on, but I wanted to help you guys to understand that this is a business for people and they are definitely in it to make money. So they are going to do their homework. Uh, they're going to try to do some basic things. It really depends on the person. Uh, but if you've got a 14 year old kid who's just running a program that he's hoping that that program will find a low hanging fruit. So we would admonish you guys, don't be the low hanging fruit. Don't make my password, my dog's name. And my dog's name is found on Facebook. You know, these are the types of things that really hurt us. Um, but make yourself uh, the, a, a difficult um, target. And we'll talk more about how to do that um, because it can really uh, cause quite severe problems for you as they, as they move through the environment. So one of the things that um, I wanna also uh, show you is how to protect yourself. And this one's a real simple example. Uh, this is an email a screenshot that I put together and you can see how this was a similar way that the hacker did it on the video. And they've got this click here to download your documents or receive your funds, whatever they put in there. But you notice that that link is a hyperlink and you can't actually see where that goes. One of the most effective ways for you guys to see where that goes is to hover your mouse over the link. So in this case, if I were to hover my mouse over this link, it shows me in a pop-up where that link is taking me. So now I'm going, okay, wait a minute. I thought I was going to go to ups.com, but here I'm going to this website that has a .ru in Russia. Don't click on that. Uh, the fact that the email is sitting in your inbox it, uh, simply doesn't mean that you've been attacked. It just means that there's some bait out there that they want you to bite on and the click is the, is the attack. So if you click on that item, uh, you definitely want to take some action right away. The first things that I would recommend that you do is uh, change your passwords uh, to anything that you uh, clicked on. Occasionally, when you click on it, it'll actually take you to a page and ask you to log in. Uh, so I would be wary of that if you gave them that password, immediately change that. But this is the how a phishing attack works and how you can protect yourself simply uh, by hovering over the link. Now, there's a different uh, a situation uh, here where uh, he created a, a email that looked like it was a legitimate piece of software. And we can see there that reset your password link. If we were to hover over that, in this case, it would actually take them to the fake website. And on the right, that's, that's the fake website. And they basically went out and what's called scraped that website. And in five minutes, they created a website that looks exactly like the real thing. And now you think you're logging in and you're typing in your username and password. You just gave them your password which is what happened in the video. So that's certainly uh, something that you wanna protect against. Most of the time we find that when people are compromised, it's because they, uh, their password was, was compromised or they actually entered in their password into a phishing website and uh, actually gave the bad guy their password. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you really have to guard yourself against these emails. If you didn't ask for it, don't click on it. Uh, if, you, if your banking institution, for example, needs something, call them, ask them to help you, uh, you know, send you something new um, and make sure you call the number that you know, not the number that's on the email uh, that's sitting in your inbox. Now, there's an alternate uh, type of attack that's called an impersonation attack. And an impersonation attack is designed, of course, to make it look like there's somebody that they're not. Now, this example is within my organization, this gentleman, Mike Tackett, he's one of our employees, I know him, and uh, he sends me this email and it says, you know, I've prepared this quote for you to look at, click this link. Now, if I hover and I showed you my previous tip, it looks like this. 
So now I'm looking at that and I'm going, that doesn't look right. Um, I don't think I should click on that. And I might pick up the phone. Hey, Mike, am I supposed to, did you send me that email? He might say, nope, I have no idea what you're talking about. So that's how an impersonation attack works is uh, they make it look like they're, uh, they're the person in your organization. And how hard would it be for them to find that information? Could they go on LinkedIn? Could they go on your website and actually find out who the CFO is and, and send an email saying, please wire this money? In many organizations, that's quite simple to do. Um, so this is a, a, how you might protect yourself against an impersonation attack by hovering and seeing something there that looks peculiar. Um, two, uh, you'll notice in this slide down at the bottom, a lot of people have adopted this where you get this subject line and it says uh, external or out, outside of our organization. We recommend that. Uh, we like to put it at the bottom of our email um, so that it doesn't change the subject line because uh, that can be annoying and difficult to find things. But let's face it, most of the emails that we send are outside of our organization or family. So uh, we know that, but we want the quick glance. We wanna know, hey, did Mike, did you really send this? And I can tell right here that he didn't send it because my mail server handles the mail for all my staff. So if I send an email to Mike, it never left our mail server, it's internal. So this, this is telling me at the bottom that the email came from outside of our organization. So why would Mike have sent me something from outside of our organization? He wouldn't have, uh, this, is, this is actually an external email. So this is another reason why um, we, we can use visual cues like this one at the bottom and your IT manager or consultant can help you to enable these if you don't already have them. And that'll help you to just immediately go, yep, I don't wanna click on that and I delete, I don't have to call Mike. Uh, it's just immediate visual cue um, that I can move on with that helps me against the impersonation attack. Uh, by the way, uh, last year impersonation attacks rose by over 500% according to uh, one security company. So they were quite popular uh, and we definitely saw them effective uh, when people were trying to get their CFO to, to uh, wire some money uh, to their account. So this uh, example is something called cyber squatting. And I, earlier we talked about how uh, when we looked at the domain name, uh, it, look, it looked like, hey, that looks like my domain name. Now this is our domain name, decyphertech.com in the blue on the left. And on the, in the column here in the middle, uh, you can see all these different variations of the name. Look closely at this one at the top. If you skim this really quickly, uh, you might see something that looks a little peculiar. These E's are actually uh, not real E's. They don't look like this one. It looks like a little trident or a Greek character. And what this is, is a, it's a design to fake you out so that uh, the person goes, oh, that's my domain. It's not dot Russia. It's not uh, something fake. It's really mine. And then they click on that. So this, uh, so what they do is they actually register a domain name that looks very similar to yours. And now it looks believable. So we've seen this happen in out in the wild uh, where um, some of our clients had uh, names that were uh, not easily spelled, let's say. And so they flipped the I and the E or there was too many extra consonants and vowels. And it looked to the staff like that was actually the email address. And they started conversing with the bad guy, thinking that uh, that impersonation attack was actually with the CFO. They were having a conversation. Turns out it wasn't him at all. Um, it was a totally wrong domain name. So what this highlights for us is you need to be diligent in really looking at where is the email coming from? Uh, where is the website taking me to? Do I recognize the website? Uh, is it really what I think it's supposed to be? Um, that'll be a good way for you to protect yourself when you get these uh, types of phishing attacks uh, via uh, cyber squatters or uh, phishing experts as well. So another one that I wanted to show you guys about, I'm actually gonna stop this uh, slide and transition you over to a web page. There's a, um, a lot of people haven't heard of uh, Microsoft Fellows. There's actually a, uh, about a dozen Microsoft Fellows. And these are the top Microsoft guys, uh, the geniuses behind everything. This particular gentleman, uh, his name is uh, Troy. He is a Microsoft Fellow. And Troy uh, found a problem um, that was uh, prevalent out there. He, and what happens is that the bad guys will hack a, a company. Let's say, for example, you had an Experian credit report and you created an account with them and, and they made you put in your social security number and along comes a bad guy and he gets all of these social security numbers, all of these usernames and passwords. Well, he creates a library of those. So now when he goes to a webpage like office365.com or gmail.com, 
he can start running those usernames and passwords that are real usernames and passwords against those hoping to get access to them. And that's called a dictionary attack. Uh, they can run every word in the dictionary uh, and, and add all these uh, target hacks in about three seconds, uh, millions of words, uh, depending on how fast the website will process it. So they've got real passwords here. So Troy said, you know, there's a lot of companies that have been hacked and wouldn't it be a public service if there was somewhere where we could all go to find out has my email been added to any of uh, databases on the dark web. So I'd encourage you guys to actually check this out. Um, this is so we know that this is a good guy and he's created this project uh, and it's called um, the website is a little unusual in hack uh, culture. Uh, when they hack you, they say you've been owned. I own you. And so they also have a, a variation of their uh, of the way that they type things in. It's called elite speak. And so here, this is uh, imagine this is an O. And so this so he used kind of hacker terminology when he made this domain. Um, so it looks like P W N E D. But I'd encourage you to check it out. And what it does is it actually tells you um, that hey, these are the websites that we've seen that have actually had. Uh, user information leaked to the dark web. And check out this one at the bottom, Zynga. Uh, if you've ever played Words with Friends or any of those games, your email address may be in their database. How would we know? So the way that it works is you actually just go in and type in your email address. And I'll give you an example. This is an older email address that I no longer use. And when I click here, it actually goes and searches against the database. And it goes, uh-oh, I've found that email address in 11 sites that have been breached. Um, and so this helps us to understand and where were those breaches? My email address was in Adobe. They were breached in October 2013 and it goes on and on and you can see all the different sites. So what this helps you to do is to see A, uh, is my email address compromised from some third party? And B, um, am I still using the same password that I used years ago? Um, because these might be old databases. So this really emphasizes the need to change your password frequently. Now, if I were to type in a different email address, uh, maybe a, a more current variation, I might see, well, I've only got, this one's only been in three databases. Um, we can do all kinds of searches in here, but this is a, I call this kind of a public service um, because we can see here that um, I've not been found on this email address. And so this is a nice way for us to check and see, uh, hey, I really need to go change that password. But really, if you guys use a password manager, it encourages you to change your password every 90 days. And these, this is the reason why. Um, the old thought with people was, let me use my same password on all these websites because I can remember this one password. Um, but as soon as they have that account, now they've got access to all these other sites. So I really encourage you guys to uh, check this out. This is a great tool uh, created by a legitimate uh, source, uh, one of the Microsoft fellows. Um, so that's a really good one. So I, I often tell people in our uh, discussions, you know, go, go do the research and look and see what databases you're in and uh, check back from time to time. But as you do that, you'll find um, that, hey, maybe I need to get a password manager. So we really do recommend a password manager because um, I, when I talk to people about creating a password, we say your password needs to be 15 characters long. And you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not a Scrabble champion, so I don't know any words that are 15 characters long. Well, what do I do? So I would recommend that you stop thinking about passwords and you stop uh, and you start thinking more about pass phrases. So make it a sentence. Uh, make the, the sentence something that you like, like a, a little phrase like birds of a feather flock together or pretty penny. And as long as you have a couple numbers and a couple upper and lower cases in there, you're going to meet almost everybody's compliance standard requirement. Um, so make that pass phrase a new thing instead of, uh, instead of a word that you're trying to use with your birth date and social security number and all these other things attached to the end. Uh, and then change them frequently. Uh, this is what we recommend uh, for a company uh, to do in when they're compliance. If we had our choice, we would say do this at the bare minimum. Uh, don't use the last four passwords. Make sure that your password is changed every three months or, or uh, something along that lines. Um, don't allow your password to be changed uh, more than once a day. Um, that's that minimum password age. Um, things like that. The character length is a very important because when they're using auto generation tools, uh, the smaller it is, the faster they can get to uh, the source of what is that password if they were using that tool. So these are uh, what we would recommend. Um, and then also this auto lockout after 15 minutes. Oops, let me go back. 
um, at the bottom down there, that auto lockout uh, helps it to where if you're sitting at your computer, for example, what happens if you ran out to lunch and here comes the delivery guy um, and he sits down at your computer, what could he get access to? Um, could he forward an email uh, that, that uh, you have in your inbox? I know with uh, everyone working from home, the physical security maybe isn't top of mind like it used to be, um, but we certainly would uh, see in large companies where people would leave sticky notes on their desks and they would, uh, and bad guys would literally come in and sit down, get some information and get out or install a program uh, physically so, because you didn't even click it, it ran. Um, so those are some good suggestions on password strength. So overall, um, what we wanted to do in this kind of first 30 minutes is give you some real examples that people are actually doing these things. And uh, I'd like to tell you a couple quick stories and then open it up to some questions. Uh, one story that I heard when I was doing this very seminar uh, or webinar was um, from one team member uh, with a company that we were doing a lunch and learn. And they said, you know, um, I set down my phone one time and uh, turned around and uh, grabbed it and went on my way. A couple days later, I had realized that my SIM card had literally been replaced in my phone. And it turns out that because the SIM card was, uh, my SIM card was with someone else, they were able to call Verizon and get access to my Verizon account. And now all my text messages were going to their phone. And guess what I was doing? I was doing two-factor authentication. So when they tried to log into my bank and they tried to reset my password, they were getting the text message with the code. They could reset all my passwords. So what that demonstrated was it, they didn't have your password. They, had, uh, they found a way to change it. So physical security is important. And I would encourage you guys uh, through this next story, uh, someone said, hey, I would like to give you my phone number. Um, can I have your phone? They grabbed the phone, uh, kept it for maybe 30 seconds and uh, added this contact. Well, the person found out uh, at the end of the day that they had uh, went into Venmo and taken out $5,000 from their bank account um, because they did it so quickly, the person didn't even realize it. So uh, this and the other story demonstrate, don't let people touch your phones, especially if your phone is the thing that, that does your two-factor authentication um, because those are true stories from people in Colorado that are in small businesses and uh, they shared those with me. Um, but on a bigger scale, when you think about companies um, one story that uh, I would like to share was a, 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 a successful business owner who called me and she said, I think that I've been compromised. You know, what do you recommend that I do? And this is what I would usually say. I'd say, well, if, if the compromise you think happened recently, then we would say, of course, change all your passwords. But uh, if you think that it's been going on a long time, we actually need to reformat all your computers. Because if they've been in your system long enough, um, it's very difficult to get the software out. Uh, they're hiding behind uh, shadows and things. And so a reformat is the only surefire way to get rid of it. So we would back up all the data, uh, virus scan the data, and then rebuild the operating system, reload the data. Well, she opted not to do that. She said, no, I think, I think if uh, I'll just change my password, you recommended a password manager. Um, we actually went in and made all of her passwords super long. So we felt good about the password change, but we, we couldn't guarantee that uh, the cleanup had been completed. Well, it turns out about three weeks later, uh, Wells Fargo uh, started changing her account information and somehow she got an email through uh, because they had changed the email that the Wells Fargo was going to. And they literally were, uh, she stopped them within an hour of doing a large wire transfer um, because they had so much access to her information. And it was such a nuisance to her that she had to shut down 12 bank accounts, fly to California and do and handwrite checks for payroll to people um, because of how much access the bad guys got. So what that demonstrated was uh, sometimes we think, oh, it's not that bad. I just need to change my password and I'm going to be fine. Um, but we would say, no, you actually need to go all the way and reformat your computer or maybe actually put something in your system to monitor it. And um, we call that uh, uh, active threat detection and mitigation. Um, because these guys, if you think about a real burglar being inside your house, you would have a motion detector. Well, 
why have a motion detector if you've got an alarm on your front door? Because just in case they get in, you want to know that they're in. So it's the same with cyber. You need to watch inside. And, and none of us can really do that effectively on our own. Um, there's a lot of great tools. Uh, there's security operations teams. These uh, bad actors are usually coming from countries like China, Brazil, uh, the, the stands, I like to call it, to use Uzbekistan and things like that. And so they're doing it in the middle of the night while you're asleep. So how would you even know? Um, if you didn't have some tools aiding you to do that. So we definitely encourage, if I were to give you a roadmap, uh, just on your own personal level and for your business, get a password manager, increase your password complexity, uh, take, cl pay close attention to what you're clicking on and don't click on it. If, you, if it looks suspicious, delete it and the person will call you if they really need you to see this thing that they've sent you. Or you can uh, pick up the phone and call them back. That's the best form of authentication. Uh, I, I believe that there is. And then finally, if you feel that you've been compromised uh, to actually go as far as to do a restore uh, of your data. And remember, a restore of your full computer might bring back the virus if, uh, depending on how long ago uh, they hacked you. And if you don't know, then we need to do a fresh wipe of the operating system and bring back files uh, after we've scanned those. So those are, that's some of the remediation plan um, that we have. Now, remediation, when we think of it, think about 911. If you call 911, do you want a lifeguard to show up when you're in a car accident? No, I want the police, I want a paramedic, maybe the fire department. So who are you calling? And do they have a remediation plan? So I would encourage you guys to test your, your favorite consultant or nephew or whoever you talk to, to say, what are you gonna do if I get hacked? Do you, like, what's your, your remediation plan and see if they know what to do. A good IT company um, would have a remediation plan with a process steps of verbal authentication checks. Um, they would tell you exactly what these uh, series of things need to do. And they would also know what the legal implications are. The state of Colorado defines a, uh, a breach as simply as my password has been compromised. And a breach in a lot of contracts has a lot of, uh, uh, has a lot of repercussions. Um, customers may need to be notified uh, and maybe all of a sudden now they don't wanna do business with, the, with you because they don't feel that you're secure. So there are legal consequences. And one tip for you is um, if you ever get into a situation where you feel your customer data has been breached, we recommend that you actually hire a consultant that will work through an attorney or you hire an attorney because then everything they find is privileged information. They don't have to turn it over to uh, the, the police uh, when they do their subpoena. And that might be necessary depending on how uh, sensitive the information is that you're keeping for your customers. So these are a few things that we've navigated through the last 15, 20 years of working in the, in the Colorado area. Um, and we wanted to pass on some of those tips to you. Um, we've, we've had some very crazy, interesting things where the FBI has been involved, um, where people were uh, literally getting raided while um, they were talking to them on the phone. It's, it's been crazy and we've seen a lot of things, but I do want to emphasize to you that, that this is a real business for people and you are not uh, too small for any person to be hacked. Uh, they, they don't care um, if they can get $100 from you or $100,000. Um, if they can use the same tool and somebody clicks on that, they're, then they want to own your information and try to make that to where they can extract that, the, the, as much money as they can from you. So please uh, do your utmost to stay diligent in, in, um, in protecting yourself and uh, take measures you know, to make that part of your everyday life, you know, just like as you would lock your door. Hopefully in Colorado, we're a little lax on that. Well, we would also want to have a strong password and we would wanna make sure that, that the systems we're using are secure. So I would like to kind of stop there since I, um, I've had about 30 minutes to talk you through those things and I'd be more than happy to individually uh, speak with you guys in this forum or offline. If you have questions on anything that I talked about, I know um, a few people uh, weren't able to join right away, but if there's anything I can discuss or answer, I'd be happy to do that. But thanks for your attention. It's nice to be with you guys today. Or I'll start out right away. I'm already thinking like password managers. Of course, I have Keychain. I have a Mac, so I use Keychain. Um, put everything on the cloud. I used to have it um, kind of just in the you know on the hard drive or whatever. Now everything's mm -hmm. in the cloud. And um, I mean, like Google, right? I use Google most of the time as my search engine, and they have a password manager that saves passwords as well. So I'm thinking I have backup, right? I have mm -hmm. one main place, and then I know most of my passwords are backed up mm -hmm. on the Google manager. Is that a good practice, or are those can those easily be hacked? 
as well. Yeah, the, the one in the Google browser is, uh, is interesting because if someone sat down at your computer and they started using it, they would just have access to get prompted for all of your passwords. So now imagine the bad guys remoted into your computer and they just pull up your website and they go to usbank.com and there's your password just popped right in. So that one I don't love um, it because of that reason. The, some of the best password managers, uh, they require you to re-authenticate yourself after a certain amount of time. You can set that or if your computer goes to sleep, whereas the browser password tool typically will not do that. It's just always there. So I don't like those for that reason. Uh, some of the ones that I have found that work really well, if you're a Mac user, uh, the one password with the numeral one um, and for your personal space, uh, there's one called Duo. Uh, and there's also LastPass. These are some of the popular ones. I'm constantly reading articles and seeing what is the latest uh, and greatest with those. And uh, we found that they work really well on your phones, which is awesome. If you can push that same password from your phone to your computer, now where does the database live? It used to be that the data would live in an encrypted file on Dropbox. I don't love that. Uh, One password and some of the others have now got their own uh, cloud encryption service. And so if I'm trusting them to hold all my password, I'm kind of trusting that their cloud service will, will be secure as well. And you got to know the bad guys are trying to break into their cloud database. And so they're using military grade encryption. And supposedly um, there's very, you know, that you can't crack that if you had 10 years of just trying passwords, it wouldn't crack. So that's my comfort level is that I would be willing to use something like LastPass or 1Password. Uh, and then it percolates down to all my devices, which is great also for, for your family. Um, you know, my wife is always saying, Hey, what's the password to the bank? You just changed it. You didn't tell me. Well, now it's in the password manager and she just gets right access right away or she changes it. Um, I don't even know what it is. And, and to be honest with you guys, I don't actually know what a lot of my passwords are. Um, I make them, I let the password manager do a random and it's super long. Like my email password is probably 60 characters long. And if I have to type it in, it takes me about 60 seconds because it's so long. Um, so it's okay if you don't know what the password is, if you use a good password manager. Did that answer your question? And sure so, okay, good. Yeah. Excellent. Other questions? Like you can just go ahead and unmute yourself. So we have a yeah, just group to manage. Chime, chime right in. I'll keep asking. Go for it. <laughs> oh, Justin, Justin just unmuted. Go oh, ahead. thanks, Justin. I was working on it. Hey, Far, how are you? Good, good to see you, Justin. Yeah, you too. I have a question for you. It sounds like I mean, there's all the the digital kind of things like you can do the password managers, but if the, if the humans in the organization are the weak point because of phishing attacks or because of whatever, what advice do you have for like a small two to five person organization for some kind of recurring training or like, I know there's things like having a service test you and send you phishing emails mm-hmm. and see if you handle them correctly or you sit down and you watch a webinar once a month any recommendations for good places to point a small organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, More and more, uh, we see uh, companies like Webroot who do antivirus. They're a Colorado-based company, and they're our favorite antivirus, and they actually have a uh, service that will do a phishing. uh, You can customize a phishing attack. uh, So you could make it, let's say you use some obscure piece of software uh, that that is unique to your environment. If I were to pick one, I would say like SCADA. Let's say I'm you know I'm measuring water in a water treatment plant, and so most people maybe haven't even heard of that. But maybe I can go in and customize a SCADA email, and now all my staff might be like, oh yeah, that's our system, and then they're just going to naturally think that's that's me. So you can customize that with them. It's very low cost. Uh, we offer that as part of a managed service plan. It's just baked right in. Um, but uh, you can also do uh, things like this, lunch and learns. Uh, Decipher does a lunch and learn with teams and it can be just three people and we will actually do something like this and we can customize it to your environment. Um, there is, there's a lot of great stuff out on the web. So if you have a specific thing um, that you're doing for education and training, um, we could give you some suggestions on the curriculum that you should use because there's kind of like safe practice practices for staff that they should do. And this is like one of the starting points, this discussion that I had today, like phishing attacks, uh, impersonation, those types of things, and just raising their awareness. Um, And then two, you could also use some pretty inexpensive tools to keep them, let's say, on the rails. So uh, let's say that you're working with a vendor in Colorado and they get hacked. But 
you're, that's somebody, you know, like I know these guys. And so why would I stop going to their website? How would I even know to stop going to their website? Um, so using a service uh, like Umbrella is one that Cisco bought. They used to be called OpenDNS. Webroot also has one like that. It's actually going to check the site before you get there and it won't even let you open it up. Um, and they're constantly monitoring millions of transactions a day. And um, that's, that is something that would help you and it's very low cost. And so some people might call that um, content filtering, but they have this like I'm being monitored idea. No, it's actually, we're trying to protect you. Uh, we're trying to keep the bad guys out. And that's what most of the time when we put that in a system, uh, it's not because we're trying to block where they can go um, for their free speech. It's more uh, keeping the bad guys out. And so what happens is when you go to that site, um, uh, I'll show you an example of one here. There's this website that's actually been registered um, so that you, uh, we can use it as a test and I'll see if it'll pull up for me here. I've got this tool, it's an agent on my computer and it goes with me everywhere I go. Um, so it'll always uh, block the site. And in this case, the error message isn't exactly what I remembered last time, um, but it's telling me down here, like this is, this is the test site, it's called internetbadguys.com and it actually won't let me go here. So when I click proceed go, it just doesn't let me do that. And so these services are very cost effective and they can really help your staff when they click maybe on one of those phishing attacks maybe it realizes that that's a bad site unless they custom made it for you. Um, so those are a few things that I think cover a lot of ground um, that really help to eliminate the large amount of things that people uh, are, are doing that they fall into a trap. Password management uh, is like one of the number one things. So if you can enforce that they have to change their passwords regularly and do that on your server or on the desktop level, if there isn't a server, then they just, they have no choice. They have to do it. And then that protects you as a, as a manager, business owner, you know, where your sensitive data is that it just doesn't get into the bad guy's hands. So I hope that helps a little bit. I know that there's, um, I think it's knowing what to look for is the key because there's a lot of great free stuff out on the web, um, but we might be able to help you if you have some particular concerns, get a curriculum together for your team. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Great question. Thank you. How about Clarissa, Dave, James, Micah, Caesar? Anybody had any fun questions or experiences? Hi, Clarissa. Go ahead. Um, so if one of the staff members gets hacked on their computer, does that then roll into the server? Do they, does it automatically mean they have access to the server as well? Good question. Uh, the, the best way to describe that, I would say, is imagine that you are um, going into a building with many tenants and there's an outside door that every tenant has access to. Uh, but inside the building, there are different dwellings, different offices. Even within the office, there might be more different keys. But there's a master key that can get you into every door. So it really depends on who they hacked. Do they have the master key? Is it an administrator and he can get into every door? Or does it just get him in the lobby? Because at that point, what can I do from the lobby? Now I need the next key to get in. So if the user happens to be, let's say, a 1099 employee that was doing uh, stuff just for the end of the year, they're a contractor, and they just had access to one thing, then their account isn't going to get them very far. But it got them in the door, and we should still be worried about that. We should disable that uh, contractor's account so that when they're gone, their account is no longer active. And that's one trap that a lot of people fall into is they forget to disable accounts. Employees leave contractors leave and then there's this account that's just open and maybe they just made a, a quick account oh I'm gonna set it up for you know my cam cameras cameras that's the username and password because it's my vendor and then all of a sudden that's out there so uh, so changing passwords a lot is helpful but to, to answer your question it depends on the, the privilege level of the key of the user um, what can they get into and then that could inherit them access into the rest of the system the way computers work is uh, kind of like if you've ever been into a building where they look at your ID once and then they put it away and they give you a badge or like the TSA kind of does that. It's like, okay, you're, you're authenticated. We don't need to see your ID anymore. That's a little bit how a password works. Uh, it's called a token. After the initial password, that token is passed around and that gets you access into things. So the server sees you the same way. Okay, Clarissa just logged in. Uh, she now has a token to get into these doors, um, but, but the admin told me she can't get into this door. You know, that's how the, how the authentication works, if that helps to understand a little bit behind the, the answer I gave. Question Great. Yeah, good question. Go ahead, Jen. 
Um, if I have been compromised, like if I realize that someone has gotten into my email or, or anywhere I might have been compromised and I suddenly realize it, besides changing my password, is there anything else that I should do right away? And is there anything that um, I can't do on my own? Good question. I like programs uh, for helping identity theft because that's kind of what some of this boils down to and like a life lock and things like that um, to get them to look for things on your credit activity. Are they trying to open up new accounts or um, was some charge made? Um, you can certainly uh, call your credit card companies and ask them to change your card, give you a new number um, so that, that uh, if that information was somewhere in an email um, that was sitting in your inbox that they, they have access to, now that's been changed. Um, remember, usually they're after the money. So what are the money, what are the financial things that you can do to protect yourself? Uh, uh, call, change your password. Um, if they hacked you, um, like a legitimate hacker, like the one we saw in the video, they also are watching everything you're typing. So if you go in and change all your passwords, that didn't help you. Um, so sometimes you needed someone else on a different computer or you call the institution, have them change it for you. Um, those are other good tips, depending on how severe um, we start to see signs of it. And we might think, hey, I need to actually go over the full sweep here. Let me change them all and, and do that. So did that answer your question, Jen? Yeah, all thank right. you. Thank you, yep. So far, share a little bit more about what you all do at Decipher, um, as far as like your services or products you offer. Um, you know, I think, you know, initial consults. Sure. Like that. Yeah, Decipher, uh, I started in 2003 in Aspen and uh, we've grown now to uh, be one of the largest, I think we're the largest IT provider in the Rocky Mountains, uh, but we also have a Denver office and an office in South Florida. And this year we were awarded uh, through Colorado Business Magazine, the best IT company of the year. So we're really proud of that. And we're actually uh, a lot less expensive than other IT providers because we really been focusing on the last three or four years on improving our processes and really uh, being focused on um, process driven organization. And we've kind of refined our focus. We used to be the master of many, now we're a master of few things, but that helps us to keep our costs down. So when you look at an IT consultant, um, there might be the guy um, that kind of runs his own show and his overhead is going to be lower and they're still going to be less expensive. But the question is, what do they, what can they do? Are they going to be that lifeguard when you called 911? Our team uh, being large and we've got a lot of different specialists. So we have specialists that do many different things. So we can really help people in many areas uh, with, with what we do. And, and often there's two different ways to engage us. Uh, there's as needed, um, which our industry calls break fix. It breaks, you call us, we fix it. And uh, we have discounts for retainers and things like that. But there's also what's called a managed service. And we definitely recommend for everyone, even a small shop like, uh, like Justin's with three people, it can be affordable. And managed service means that there's proactive things happening. Uh, we're updating your computers and software. We're helping you. We're doing lunch and learns. We're, we're trying to make it to where you don't have uh, emergencies because we're maintaining the system before the oil ran out or the, or the radiator fluid ran out. We're actually checking all the levels and doing those things to make sure that your, your most important asset besides your people is your, probably your computer, um, that that's constantly up and running because that has a huge impact on your business. So uh, Decipher has uh, probably 20 or so staff members in the Roaring Fork Valley and um, we're happy to be local and available um, but we also uh, because we narrowed our focus uh, security is one of our big focuses cellular and IT management but we know a lot of people so if you call us up and say hey I need a website developer uh, we we don't do that uh, anymore we would like to refer that out to one of you guys or somebody that we know that does a does great work so we're really trying to leverage relationships and and uh, help people find the right match for what they need well I, i've been um thoroughly educated <laughs> well probably only on the surface right because there's so much more that can mm -hmm. be done but i'm starting to at least it just widened my perspective to mm -hmm. look what to look for or look at my programs and seeing how secure they actually mm -hmm. are and again like i said i put trust that you know these systems that we use you know um have that already in place but yet you know mm -hmm. i haven't really probably asked the questions or looked um to confirm it because of as i've said my high level of trust so mm -hmm. um i i this has been great to kind yeah, of yeah no problem manager 
Yes. Yeah. So have a little bit of paranoia. It's healthy. And also um, we didn't talk about two-factor authentication. That'll be for a future discussion. But if, if I could, I would say use two-factor authentication on everything because that gives you the, that, that uh, second kind of quarantine door before they actually get access to your full system there. And um, not everyone offers that on their platform, um, but some vendors allow you to apply it to everyone. So uh, that, that password manager might help you to do two-factor authentication and, and it doesn't have to be that uh, mind numbing. It is a little bit of extra work, but it's so much more worth it uh, to avoid getting hacked because it really kind of wrecks your day, week, month, life, depending on what they get. So. So one last thing, what would be outside of like the, the I'm just thinking like, um, how would you know you're hacked? You know what I mean? And you, you've talked about the, the emails and some of those things, but like, and this is coming from my own, my, like I have OneDrive, I, I do Office 365, and I think my OneDrive, I always hear the computer running more than I think it should be. And mm. my guess is it's trying to sync, right? That's mm. why it's kind of looking for something or there's a sync error and that's why it keeps trying to run and run and run. But that's the kind of stuff that every once in a while, I'm like, wow, why is my computer keep running? Is something I hacked? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe, so I don't know. yeah. That's uh, something using the processor could be doing that, but it, uh, that might not be the trigger. Uh, <laughs> I've certainly seen that related to, to things that are going on, but I more, uh, the ones that we see most often, uh, this one actually is pretty common, is we ask people to look in their inbox for rules. Um, unbelievably, many hackers will create one or two rules where the rule is automatically forwarding all of your mail, mail to them and then it's deleting that from your sent items so you can't tell. But there's a rule in there somewhere and a lot of people don't use mail rules or if they do, they, they know them well. So check your rules in your email. Uh, that would be a, a one that I would recommend for sure. Uh, the next one would be, uh, of course, if you see something suspicious going on, uh, sometimes I would hear people say, hey, I think I saw my mouse moving. Definitely, uh, that would be a good reason for us to start some remediation action uh, if you weren't expecting it. When uh, IT professional remotes into your computer, usually there's a sign somewhere like ours is a bar at the top and it says, you know, FAR is controlling your computer. So it's, we're not trying to hide that, but you can, the mouse moving is an obvious one. Um, so that would be another tip. And then sometimes you might get um, somebody uh, emailing you that, it sounds like they're responding to something that you did not send them, uh, but you didn't see the sent item, you know, so that might be a part of an impersonation attack. So uh, pick up on those cues and make sure, you know, the best form is to call the person and just say, Hey, am I reading this right? And the, did you really send that? Cause you'd be amazed. I've had people that I found out they were talking to the bad guy via email for like weeks and they didn't know. And it's, and some people like immediately two emails in, they're like, wait a minute how did you just email me and you walked by the office that, you know, like they visually figured that out. And so it's that kind of thing where you just trust that it's really the person, but it's, but I would say, try not to trust that and, and be a little suspicious. Uh, um, yeah. So those are a couple that come to mind. Great. And, and I, um, just before we wrap up, I think the last question is, should we have our cameras taped? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but uh, like obviously I'm using it now, but I think, um, you know, the little green dot doesn't have to go on for your camera to be on even on your phone and things like that. Um, but I, we think that that's, a, that's one of those healthy paranoia things where it's okay to do that, you know, for sure. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Really appreciate everyone uh, joining today. And uh, if, and uh, if you would like to um, find out more, I think that uh, I can, we can uh, get you guys some more specific information um, if you'd like to see anything. Um, like I was talking to Justin about maybe like a curriculum that would be for his staff. Uh, so something like that. Um, I, earlier, you guys saw my email address um, on the screen, but I'll, I'll put it up for just a second also if I can get the uh, font to be proper size. And Jen, if you want to send me anything, any like follow up, I, I mean, since, you know, everybody registered, I have emails, I can just do a quick follow up to thank everybody for coming and pass on any, um, at least a, a, an introduction, you yeah. know what I mean, mm -hmm. to you directly type of a thing with a contact information. Absolutely. I'm already putting together an email for you. Okay, fantastic. So we'll just send that out to everybody. Okay. Um, I can even get that done this afternoon, make it easy. Okay. 
And I just wanted to, again, thank you, Far and Jen, for being here from Decipher and just raising the bar of awareness around mm -hmm. um, cybersecurity and just being more resilient in our, in our lives and having peace of mind. And now hopefully you have some tips and tricks to do that. Um, and next Tuesday, it's me uh, as I am the executive director of RFL and I am certified in a lot of different, I'd say, um, leadership uh, development and personal behaviors. I'm going to do a talk on empathy um, because I think like we can get triggered so easily with that level, like, you know, we're ticking at high levels. Our brains are overused. We're overusing decision making and all these things right now that, you know, to pull out empathy um, is sometimes hard. We like, we forget because we get kind of unconscious and um, a lot of statistics are showing empathy as an emotional intelligence skill is actually declining even in younger generations. So um, I'm gonna talk about just make, being aware of our empathy, how we should be potentially using it um, because you know people don't like expressing emotions, right? That's kind of, I think that's a stereotype that's out there. And when we're more vulnerable, um, open to listening to others experience without taking things personally, we're, we're so much more effective. So that's what the next conversation is going to be on next Tuesday. And of course, rfleadership.org. Um, you can see right at the top, we have buttons that you can either apply. We're accepting applications for our 10-month program that will be starting the end of August. Um, those applications are due August 1st. But another button right on the top is resiliency resources. And there's where you would be able to click to see upcoming events um, and other resources that we have found um, that could be very helpful if it's, you know, CCD links or C... Um, yeah, CDC links, sorry. Um, other local like CMC is offering a lot of resources. Um, Mind Springs is offering resources. Even Yale has a free well-being program that we've got that link, everything's up there. So we're just, RFL is here to support us so that we can thrive, um, make it through this pandemic and even other scenarios that show up in our lives so that we can continue to um, problem solve and be effective and have a really amazing community here. I well, really appreciate what you guys are doing. So thank you very much for having us and for all that you're doing for the community. Thank you. Jen? I Jen, second that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so that's it for this resiliency experience. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and we'll send a follow-up email for everybody as well. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.